type them in the box and we'll stop periodically uh, and answer those questions. So yeah, most of you have done these webinars before, so I don't need to go on about it too much. But there is one thing you could do, if it all goes pear-shaped, you could call Ellen. Ellen from Cox in All is, is in the co-pilot seat, keeping everything running smoothly in the background and uh, her, her mobile number is there. You might like to scribble that down on a piece of paper and um, yeah, if you have connection problems, give her a call. Or if you really have connection problems, then you can just wait and pretty quickly we get this up on the WeedSmart website uh, as a recording that you can go back to and listen to. So yeah, that's Ellen's number. She'll hopefully keep it all going smoothly. We've got quite a few attendees on now, so great to have everybody here. And uh, yeah, we're just about ready to go, I think. Um, this Today's webinar is about the harvester setup for harvest weed seed control. So how do we get these big machines set up so that we're maximising the number of weed seeds that we capture in whatever tool we are using. And so who better than to talk about this than Ray Harrington. Ray, the inventor of the Harrington Seed Destructor among other agricultural inventions and long-term farmer and has a real knack for setting his header up uh, to, to maximise not only the weed seeds coming out of it, but also minimising grain losses and, and, and maximising the sample. So we can learn a lot from someone like Ray. Uh, we at ARI have little expertise in farm machinery, so great to have Ray on board. And I couldn't resist putting this photo in Ray. This is Ray in front of the original prototype Harrington Seed Destructor, which um, is a wonderful photograph, I think. I, my only regret is there's no bike wheel on there, Ray, but uh, apart from that, that's where it all started in your workshop right there. And um, yeah, I'll just introduce Ray and, and welcome you, Ray, and uh, get you to introduce yourself and, and say a couple of words. Yeah, afternoon, Peter and attendees. Yeah, uh, I farm south of Darkin. Um, this is my uh, 52nd crop, so I've been around a while. But way back in 96, 97, I decided to sell my 12,500 sheep uh, in the best sheep country in West Australia, or probably Australia, along with the Cajun up people. Um, I knew then that I would have, a, I would go into herbicide resistance problems. I didn't do something about chaff. And there was enough information around West Australia from up in the Wongwood Hills with the shields and hides and all that who had achieved staying in, staying in cropping with herbicide resistance if they dealt with the chaff. But I didn't want to burn and I decided I'd go about a different way. And uh, as you can see, that big brown thing's a mill. It's out of the mining industry. And I decided I was going to deal with the chaff that way. So uh, that was my plan to stay in cropping in this part of the world. Good on you, this Ray. project's yeah. actually 19 years old in February since I first started to build it, so it's been a long, hard slog. Yeah, people don't get 19 years for murder, do they, Ray? But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but look, you'll, uh, I think we're we're pretty hopefully pretty close to getting a good outcome and seeing this really come to fruition. We can't say anything about that until it actually happens. But um, but yeah, it's been a long, hard slog, and um, there's been a lot of work between Ray and Ari and. University of South Australia and others to, to get the Harrington Seed Destructor happening. But, but look, the, today's webinar is about this, <coughs> pardon me, once we've got the weed seeds into the harvester, how do we maximise how many of those seeds end up in the HSD or the chaff cart or the chaff deck or the chaff line? So all of these tools are tools where we are only taking that chaff fraction. So we want the weed seeds in the chaff fraction, we don't want them blowing out the back in the, the rotor. Or well, going with the grain can be okay, but we don't want to blow the weed seeds out of the back. So essentially today's webinar is about that exact topic there. Now before I sort of hand over to Ray too much, I just wanted to talk a bit about some work by Michael Walsh from ARI. And Mike is our man of Harvest Weed Seed Control and he has done an extensive research in this and really in 2010 and 2011, he really hit his straps. So in 2010, he travelled the Western Australian wheat belt doing 12 sites where he compared the Harrington Seed Destructor with the chaff cart with narrow windrow burning. Then what they did is the year after that, they uh, went and did ryegrass counts in the field where they had used the different treatments compared to a nil. And so to compare, are all of these tools equal or are some better than others? And what he found there, there's his results. So this is the, these numbers are the ryegrass germination the year after 
um, after using the treatment. So it's the reduction in ryegrass germination. So the HSD reduced the ryegrass germination by 56%, the chaff cart reduced it by 57 narrow windrow burn by 58%. So really, if we look at the LSD, they're all the same. He then hit the road again the following year and did the same thing, but this time through southeastern Australia, doing 6,000 kilometres to do 13 sites and got very, very similar results. He and Charlie Aves went out the following year, did all the ryegrass counts, I think Charlie did all of them actually, and, um, and once again found that they're all very much in the ballpark. All of these tools that, that, that uh, use ha the harvest weed seed control tools, they all produce a similar control percentage. That there is the data. So at the sites, they had varying numbers of ryegrass plants per square metre and they set a certain amount of seed per square metre. So there's the WA sites, and don't worry about these numbers too much for now. There's the, the southeastern Australia sites, and what he found from all of that was these were all wheat crops on average. Each ryegrass plant produced 210 seeds in a wheat crop. And so on average, on, across all of those sites, there were 10 ryegrass plants. So what we're talking about is he had 2,100 ryegrass seeds setting seed in these wheat crops each year. And so basically he found that all of the systems delivered the same result. They all gave an average of 57% reduction in ryegrass seed bank the next year. Now that 50, they would have actually achieved probably in the order of 70% removal of the ryegrass in the paddock, but the 57% reduction in the ryegrass germination uh, represents the fact that there is some old seed bank germinating again. So they're better than 57% weed seed removal, but that's the reduction in germination after doing this for one year. So quite an amazing result. Now the point of all of mentioning all of this is that if we couldn't separate the seeds into that chaff fraction for an HSD or a chaff cart or a chaff deck, then windrow burning would have done better than the chaff options because in windrow burning we're put getting everything out of the back of the harvester and putting it into a narrow windrow. So I really wanted to make this point that when it's set up right, we can get the, a very high level of weed seeds in the chaff and not spit them out in the rotor. So Ray, did you want to make a, a comment there? We had a bit of a discussion about this just before we went live. I think it's pretty important, Peter. We'd, we'd have to bear in mind that when Michael was doing this work, he wouldn't have been overloading the rotors in, in the chaff, with the chaff cart or the HSD. So I think this, that's really what today's all about, is, is maximising the weed seeds and, and getting them out the rotor. Yeah, and so there's message number one is it's not about having the, the handle all the way forward on the harvester uh, at the limit of the engine. It's a, you know often about maybe just pulling back that little bit and not overworking the, the harvester to get the best out of it, not only for the wheat seeds but also so we don't spit the grain out the back. Okay, so let's uh, have a look. So I've got a picture of a golf ball picking up machine there. The reason being is that Ray famously made the statement that he wants to put a bucket of golf balls in the front of his harvester and have them land on the sieve. And that sort of sums up what we're talking about today, about getting weed seeds out of the rotor. So that's what we're going to spend a few minutes on now. So this diagram here is just a bit of a schematic diagram from, uh, from Nick Berry. And Nick was an engineer at the University of South Australia who's been heavily involved in the uh, HSD um, or the Integrated Destructor um, uh, project. And uh, hopefully this spotlight's working. Is that working there, Ray? You can see that red yep, spotlight. Yep, yeah. very good. So this is just a schematic drawing showing that we have the straw coming into the rotor here. The straw goes to the beater, is thrown up high and exits the machine at the back. Whereas out of the rotor comes the grain and the chaff. That lands on the sieve, the grain obviously falling through to be collected, and then we have wind blowing up to blow that chaff up into a stream here. Uh, th this is the chaff stream. So what this point of this drawing is, is just really to schematically show how the harvester works and also introduce this concept of the separator baffle here, which is a baffle plate that 
that goes into different harvesters so that we can get the char fraction into underneath the baffle and direct that into the HSD or the chaff cart or so on uh, and not blow the chaff up into the straw here and have it um, blown out with the with the straw. So there's two things there. One is we've got to get those weed seeds out of that rotor there and onto this sieve uh, so that they're not exiting in the straw fraction here. And secondly, we don't want to blow this chaff all the way into the back up into the straw stream and hence the separator baffle. So Ray, I just wonder if you want to make some comments here before we show some pictures of the inside of your harvester about, about how it all works. Yeah, Peter, I think the first thing we've got to realise, if you take your, your spotlight back to the word thresher, now we, we have to realise that the material is only in the, in the combine or the header, get a bit Americanised, uh, in, the, in the header for five seconds. You know, one, two, three, four, five, and it's out. Now, this is this is where we've got to get the weed seeds out in that five seconds, and and also get all the grain out. Now, the modern headers, like I did some homework. Um, in the last 15 years, they've doubled the horsepower in the headers. They've gone from 280 maximum to to, to 560, 600, and and yet when I look at the specs on on all the headers, they have not increased the size of the cleaning areas and the rotors by any more than about 10%. So I think there's an area there where we need to be careful about overloading the things and, and understanding that it's only in the machine for five seconds. Excellent. So we're going to come back to this diagram. I've just sort of introduced it there. Um, but that sort of schematically shows what we're talking about. Okay, let's have a, I've got to try and get rid of this thing now. And let's, <laughs> can't get rid of it. Anyway, uh, I'll turn it off. Here we go. Go away. Uh, that's a bit of a bummer. And now I can't advance my slides, Ellen. Any advice on how to turn this thing off? Ah. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. This is very. Uh, I shouldn't do things that I uh, don't really know how to how to do. Ah, oh, damn thing. All right, there we go. It's advanced. So, this is the first concave section. Sorry about that. This is the first concave section of Ray's eighty two thirty case header, and this is the second concave section. Now, this is uh, where we're talking about the first bit of threshing happens. And, um, and we need to get the weed seeds out of the rotor. And so, Ray, you, I've got there that you, you'll, you're prepared to open these things up to get in there and modify them from how they come set up from the dealer. So I'll hand over to you to explain what you're talking about there. Yeah, well, on, on our uh, second concave, we take out half the wires. Now, it's a pretty well-established practice, and it's... It's interesting that the red de the red um, dealers across the state have got their heads together, and they got a bit of a bit of a plan going now, where they're looking outside the box as well, um, and doing things like this. So yeah, we take every second wire out, and that'll open that one up to an 18 mil gap. So they now become 18 mil gap with every second wire out. And, and I so think you basically only do what we that in the second concave section, no? In, in in the second one, yeah. Yeah, mm. you get most of your grain out through your first concave, but you, if you're having trouble with the sample, with the thrashing, you've got to. I would start putting those second wires back in. So it's about opening it up till you go too far, then sort of coming back a bit. So we take all those second wires out of the, the second concave, and then if its conditions are a bit tough, we would start at the front of the concave and put the wires back in the first section and leave the next section to see if we can solve the problem. Because some years you get difficult thrashing. Okay. okay. So that's step number one is is in that very first bit of concave where the threshing's happening. Don't be afraid to, to open it up and, and take some wires out and let more out of the rotor. Here's the second bit is uh, this further down the road we've got the, the grates and this is where you say, Ray, that you'd like to get a, a golf ball out of those grates and have big open ones. Now, your, I think your case header came set up with good open grates, but 
Um, do you modify these at all, or are you, or are you happy with how open these are? No, these these are the most open grapes I've been able to buy um, off the, off the shelf. So back in the back in the days when we had 2388s and that, we had to uh, we actually had to cut half the bars out of the the concave material and all that. And eventually we ended up buying keystock grapes, but now these come like this, and it's uh, so I don't really have to modify them. So other harvesters raise some of them come with more closed up grapes. I think you often comment that you wouldn't be a, a, you know, afraid to get in there and, and take to them with a oxy torch and make them a bit bigger. <laughs> it's pretty controversial, but um, you know, are you thinking? Would you go and take a brand new header and, and cut bits out of it to open these things up? Well, I, th I think what we've got to look at is Australian harvest conditions, because most of our machines come out of the US or, or Germany or whatever, you, and um, I'm seeing them coming in, and I'm saying they're not opened up enough. Um, these these are, and I'm sure they I'm sure there's con uh, grapes available on the market, so and they're not coming in with them. And I think that's what our Australian farmers should be looking at with this weed problem, is, is getting the big open grapes and, and just getting more weed seeds out of their machines. Back to the same story, you've only got, once it gets onto the grape, you've probably only got two seconds, two and a half seconds at the most, and it's gone. Yep. And so it might not be an oxy torch approach, but it might be just a matter of buying an alternative grape that is a bit more open. Yeah. It certainly had to be the oxy torch with the old, the old 2388. There was no doubt about that. But we've gone past that era uh, because if you look at the top of this slide, and uh, it's probably your next there slide, is, that, yeah. that that that's what the old grapes used to be made out of. So we took every second every second rib out of those for our grapes until we were able to come up with what was called keystock grapes. So, but it's been this has been about a, a 10 or 12 year shift in thinking with my elder brother David's a, a real whiz on making headers work and, and it's about realising how little time it's in there and you've got to get it out to get it on the sieves. Yep. yep. All right. Oh, now I'm having trouble advancing my slides again. <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. All right. I'm not sure if Ellen can help me in the co-pilot seat. Uh, probably not. I think while you're trying to do that, we, we've got to we've got to load get it down onto the sieves and then so that they become the limiting factor um, and it's quite easy to test out in the paddock. You put the catch trays out and you can you can test what's coming out in the rotor. And I've even got it written on the on the office wall in here: grain loss in 0.01 of a square metre. Um, you know, 30 kilos per hectare is nine grains of wheat, one and a half lupins, seven barley, and 80 canola. So so if you stop if you stop that coming out of the rotor, that stops the weed seeds coming out of the rotor. Yeah, yeah. Because the weed seeds are just a grain. They've got they've got a kernel and they've got weight, and they'll they'll get to the outside of the rotor and they'll want to come out. And I think the other thing we haven't really talked about is the fact that your straw length, it's laying along it's laying along um, your concaves and your grates. It's not all beat up. It's it's sort of in could be up to a foot long. So we've got to stir that up to get the, the heavier weed seeds out. All right. Sorry about the tech diffs. I've got them sorted now. But uh, look, we haven't had any questions come in yet. But um, yeah, please, uh, please get some questions coming in if they spring to mind as we go, as we're charging through this pretty well. OK, now the other thing we've talked about, Ray, is, and I'm going to do the unthinkable and go back to my spotlight, but talk about what's in here inside the rotor is some uh, some separator bars that you've put in to get some extra threshing to really thresh those weed seeds out of their um, of their stem. Uh, yeah, well, or the heads. So tell us about this extra threshing bar you've got in here. Yeah, well, they, they join they join the pedestals up, and uh, that just gives you the extra the extra threshing. And there's there's things available called Gordon bars, which is the same thing. They join those pedestals up. Uh, way back when you never used to have a rotor with pedestals on it. So um, that just gives you that extra threshing and, and trying to stir that straw up a bit more. Righto, excellent. 
Righto, so that's sort of it for talking about the rotor for now. Um, we don't have any questions come in on the rotor, but uh, if you have one out there, make sure you, you tap it in now and, and we'll answer that. Okay, we're going to move to the to the baffles now, Ray, and this is um, this is what we alluded to earlier is in Nick's schematic drawing here is, is these baffles. Now, growers are having to make their own baffle. This is something that's very, very difficult for us to uh, to communicate uh, in RE uh, with harvester setup because um, you know it is all of the harvesters are so different from one another, and this is not an exact science. So, um, Ray, could you just tell us a little bit about why we need these separated baffles to, to get this chaff into our destructor or into our chaff cart? Well, the machine naturally separates naturally separates the straw and the chaff, but we don't want we don't want the weed seeds blowing over the back. Some of the, some of the machines have a complete split system, so it's so it's really not a problem. But most of the machines, three out of three out of the four, you'll you'll need a baffle to stop blowing the lighter weed seeds over the back and getting back into the straw line. So the thing you have to realise with the with the header is it now. It has a high volume, low pressure wind. So when you put that baffle in, you've got to have enough volume where the blue arrows run down on the left side of the of the black line. You have to have enough volume through there. And I'm finding with the ones I've helped set up, yeah, that's good drawing. That's a good line. Um, <laughs> Tony <I've>, Green style. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Uh, I've helped up set up a few chaff carts and that as well. Um, and I'm basically running at that foot 30 centimetres around, so the top of the separator baffle it goes above the fence, mm -hmm. but importantly, mm -hmm. importantly you need that volume there. If you draw a red line straight across at right angles to the bottom of the line, where you, where you go across there at right, yep, good. Now that's, that has to be the same from the back of the sieves, so that you can't interfere with the air on the sieves, otherwise you interfere with the sample. And of course, the sample is always paramount with how you set the machine up. So that's where I've found that. <laughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> that high saying, volume. Yeah, yeah I'm yeah. choking on it. That high volume, <laughs> low pressure air takes the chaff and the weed seeds around the corner into whatever you're doing underneath. So the trick is for this distance here and these baffles to be the same as this one here so that we don't change that pressure. Is that right? No, no, no less with the bottom line. No less. The, so this could be no a little less. bit more even. Yeah. And, and you, can have more, you can have more rather than less because it yeah. will just slow it down in there. But when you look inside your machine and the, your machine's been working, you can see where the lines are, where everything goes inside yeah. the machine yeah. and that's this has really just come about um, by a, a bit of uh, experience over a number of years of where to put it and um, yeah and that's what we've come up with so right. you've got to let you've got, got to let the air out of the sieves escape over to the top of the baffle and then you have it high enough that it won't carry the weed seeds over the baffle yeah all right, now there's a question coming, but we'll just um, finish with what we're doing here. I'll get rid of those drawings. I'm getting this thing sus now. This is all good. Okay, so now we're just going to have another look at that in a different way. This is just a cross section of a, of a fairly old harvester, obviously. And, uh, and what we're talking about is um, in this part of the harvester here is where we have the chaff, and here we have the, the straw stream. Okay, so. What we're talking about is is a baffle, pardon me, a baffle that sits in here, and like you say, that the distance uh, where that red curved baffle is there, that the distance above the sieve has to be the same as as the back. And uh, and if we're talking about this baffle ray, we're talking about having just normal amount of wind, aren't we? We don't uh, we want to set the the wind up so that we just have a for normal grain sample. We don't adjust it too much with these things in mind. No, no, it's uh, the the sample is is king. That's what we're after. So what what you do what you do to the header after that can't interfere with that. Now, just in my mind's eye, I think that that baffle there is probably 20% too high compared to the drawing because the the drawing will be in scale. The rest of the drawing will be yeah. in scale. My my mind's eye is saying it should just come down to where the grey is 
Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's just having a look at it in the mind's eye. Um, yeah, it should come down. So that's what they're looking at is don't take it up yeah, too yeah. high. That yeah, that's that looks a bit looks a bit better to me um, from looking up the back of these headers for a fair few years. Yeah. Yeah, good no, one. that's good. That's handy with a pencil. Yeah, it is good. <laughs> I quite like it. I can see what Tony Gregg was into. There. All right, so. Um, that's some baffles there. Let's just keep going with this. Here's your baffle, Ray. So this is the back of your harvester. Below this is, is some integrated mills to destroy the seeds. We can't show the audience those, but that's, um, that's uh, and I must point out that th th this is just on one side of the harvester. You've had one of them removed for us to take this photo. Um, that's, um, I, I think we decided that that is about 25 to 30 centimetres yeah above the sieve there. Yep, and that and that's where it stops there and lets the air come from the from the left over the top. Um, yep. um we weren't there by the scale other. of Yep. So so that's basically as you can see the baffles really under my arm, that's what you would running under my arm is actually the shape of the baffle, but it's a bit different with the integrator because you've virtually got two funnels. Yeah, and I think the Normally integrated it'd be also baffle, is, it'd be is sucking, right isn't it? Well, the integrated yeah. also sucks air through as well, doesn't it? Yeah, well, just just as a point of interest, the integrated part of the designing of it, it actually had to demand more air than the than you took below the top of the baffle. So that was part of the challenge of designing it. It actually it actually demands more air than the header creates. And, right. Um, because we couldn't interfere. That that was the, the biggest challenge of redesigning the thing. But that's got to be a bonus having a big vacuum cleaner down there sucking the weed seeds into it. And, and also, it stops all the dust. Yeah, right. You don't have to right. you don't have to seal it all off because uh, it, it sucks it sucks the air from the outside in, and therefore just keeps it all clean. Yeah. And uh, while we're on baffles, I've got one more here. Sorry, this is uh, one on a 9230. That's a chopper. Um, let me get my spotlight out. This is the chopper here. And they've just put a, a baffle over the chopper to divert the chaff and weed bearing chaff underneath that baffle and not spit it into the chopper. And by doing this, um, they halve the number of chaff dumps that they were getting. So this is on the Messina's harvester at Mullawa. And so they, they got a lot less chaff dumps because uh, they weren't throwing as much straw into the, into the dumps. Um, and so look, there's a lot of different people doing their own thing with baffles. There's different harvesters with different chopper setups on the back. Um, but conceptually, uh, today we've talked about how to, how to set them up and uh, and, and going back to Nick's diagram here, that really just shows um, what we've got to do to, to get these weed seeds into these places we want them to go. Okay, so um, Ray, the question that came in was somebody's asking what your uh, grain loss counts for the different crops were. Um, you mentioned them quickly, but could you just go back over that uh, um, quickly? Grain loss in 0 0.01 of a square metre for 30 kilos of per metre. hectare. Is wheat nine grains, lupins one and a half grains, barley seven grains, and canola eighty grains. There you go. So that person might be able to listen back to the recording and scribble all of that down. But I think that sort of shows what you've gone to, Ray, to measure your losses. I mean, um, you you've got a quadrat, uh, a, a tray that you run out with, which is what? Is it ten centimetres by a metre? Is it? No, by half a metre. Yep. Oh, okay. Ten by, and, by half. Uh, and yeah, I just go it out and throw it on the ground, and and um, one of the disadvantages with the integrated is you don't know how much you don't know how much grains going down the down the off the sieves, but you do know how much is coming out the rotor. Yeah, and what we know is that people that a lot of people that started towing chaff carts, uh, particularly in canola, they found big black chaff dumps <laughs> that were full of canola. And uh, and then they went and set their harvester up and then kicked themselves uh, for how much grain they'd thrown out the back for all the years prior to the chaff cart. So 
yeah, measuring grain losses is uh, is a huge thing. It's too big a topic to sort of cover in any detail now, but uh, it just sort of shows that if you don't have a tray and you're not going out into the field and you're not checking it, then you probably don't know how much you are throwing on the ground, and it's a very good thing for, for growers to be doing. Just just to confirm, confirm that, Peter, we've got Nick Berry's name up there. Nick and Chris Saunders used chaff in South Australia. They went out and got chaff uh, to do some testing for the integrated. They found that the farmer was throwing 200 kilos of a hectare of wheat out when they put that chaff in their controlled germination room. So that's a big deal. Yeah. That, that, you know, for someone that's growing one and a half ton, uh, 1.8 ton, that's a lot of wheat. It's a lot of and wheat top, regardless of how much you're growing in that. <laughs> and and it's, off the top. it's off the top. I think this will be a, uh, a future topic for a, a webinar because uh, it is extremely, uh, it's a big deal. Yeah, the, the grain, the yield loss, um, grain loss monitors aren't really uh, telling the full story, I don't think. Okay, so we're going to leave that there for now. Um, and look, we're get half an hour in. I think we might keep this thing running for another just 10 minutes or so, and just quickly talk about swathing. I know we, we talked about swathing last week in the in the webinar, but wanted to bring it up again because Ray's been swathing um, or windrowing barley uh, for many years, and um, or a few years, and it's a good way of maximising the, the harvest weed seed control tools because we. Uh, avoid some weed seed sheets. So I just wanted to go over again quickly and just hear from Ray. And, and this one we saw last week as well. Um, and this is data from Mike Walsh looking at the shedding of weed seeds and showing that our, most of our weeds have high seed retention at the beginning of harvest. And then 28 days into harvest, things like wild oats and brome grass are shedding a lot, wild radish and ryegrass holding on to more weed seeds. So this is their Achilles heel. But um, the point being that if we, if we move to swathing, we can set harvest at day zero for a while because we can swath a couple of weeks back before um, day zero here and we can swath when these weeds are holding on to their seed. So Ray, you use it to set that harvest on day zero and then go and harvest other crops, don't you? Yes, Peter, and I, and I think there'll be some interesting work done. Day zero is a good number to look at, but w Looking here this year on the property, we could be day zero minus 14. So we wonder where the we wonder where those lines will go if we start going minus one to 12 or 14. And I know with black oats, um, at at most I'll lose one or two off the top. So I think that'll be interesting work later. But really, I'm looking at I'm looking at trying to have day zero or day minus zero minus a few days and, and hold that so that then I can go and do my standing crop and then come back and pick up the windrows. Um, and it's all about it's all about getting those weed seeds into the windrow. And I think it's really particular for high rainfall country. I'm not quite sure how it'll go further out in the in the uh, lower rainfall, lower crops, but I know I know here, I'm doing 50% of my cereal program. Yep. Yep. 50% of your cereals. Yeah. And barley, isn't it? And so um, we talked last week about this again, but I wanted to bring it up again. If, we, if we've if we got our seeding direction here, um, some people are swathing. You know, there is a risk that if you swath in the same direction as seeding, that uh, the swath can get stuck on the ground and hard to pick up. Uh, I know that there are mix of belts to overcome this problem, which is a great thing that came out of Twitter. But uh, Ray, you talk about swathing on an angle and then the standing stubble becomes like bridge pylons and the bridge is your swathed barley uh, standing up on top of it. So you were doing it at 90 degrees, weren't you, and then discovered yep. that you can, um, with trials last year, that you can go uh, at 15 degree angle uh, and still have your barley sitting up nice and high. On that, on those bridge pylons of standing stubble for a long time. So, so what what we've done is we we were at 90, and now because we're, we're on nine inch spacing, and gone to a paired road seeker boot, we've uh, we're able now to to come back and at 15 degrees because of the, there's more bridge pylons in the cross section. So basically, we're back to 
six and a half inches wide. So um, we had serious issues way back um, swathing with the seeding direction. It's just terrible to pick it up and flicking up gravel rocks and that. But uh, basically because we've gone to the paired road and that, we're able to come off the 90 degrees. So it's not rocket science, it's just about what will hold the crop up. Yeah, and you swath and then leave those barley swaths there for several weeks, don't you, while you go and harvest standing crops, is that right? That's correct, yeah, and I, I, one of the first lots I did was um, the first time we had uh, oh, unicorn barley or something, and uh, it was only 30 hectares, and I didn't do that till the first week in January, and I could still, and I had 60 mil of rain on it, and I could still just slide my arms under the row. Because, you, because you're cutting it off a beer can height, that stubble's quite solid, and I think that's another point we need to look at is you need to be swathing short at that beer can height, A, to get the weeds, and B, to make the bridge pile on strong. You know, if yeah. you swath it up at 30, the whole thing would collapse. And yeah. that's something we need to be aware of. Yeah, and so it not only brings forward the um, and holds your weed seeds in that swath before day zero, but it also brings forward the harvest of other paddocks, doesn't it, that you are direct harvesting. And so it's a way of bringing forward the whole of harvest to avoid those weed seeds shedding onto the ground. Yeah, well, the second, the second half would have been uh, day 20, day 18 or something. Well, I've been... When you, when you look at the two halves of the program, we'll go day 14, well, I've been able to get the second half of the program back at day zero as well. Yeah. So doing doing half the cereal. In fact, if we can, we'll be doing the standing barley before we do the canola. Yeah, okay. So, and the canola's all wind road as well. Yeah. Excellent. Now, uh, there's a question come in, Ray. Just a point of clarification. We were talking about using a tray, throwing a tray on the ground to um, check harvest losses. Can you just clarify the size of the tray that you're using then? Mine's 100 by 500. Millimetres, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good one. Excellent. All right. And, that, and, that's, so, and that's purely to check rotor losses. Yeah, so you, you walk out and throw it under the back of the harvester as it drives past. I just stick it down alongside the wheel, the main wheel, because yep. they've got the, chart, the uh, straw spreaders the new yep. modern straw spread to spread the full width, so, yeah. Yep. Okay. Excellent. So we're getting to the end of this webinar. If you do have a last question or two, make sure you get, get it in now. In summary, today what we've talked about is, number one, don't be afraid to open up the header and the grates and the, uh, and the concaves to get those weed seeds out of the rotor. We set the header up the harvester up for normal grain sample. We're out there to harvest grain. It's not about the weeds, it's about harvesting the grain. So set the harvester up normally. Can, we've talked about using baffles and how we can use a baffle to divert more weed seeds into the chaff stream. And the last point there, Ray, we didn't really harp on about it much, but it's something we talk about a lot. Well, it's not the last point, but uh, the second last point. Um, if we're using all of our horsepower uh, we are throwing grain out the back and we are possibly, we don't know this for a fact, but we're possibly also not threshing the weed seeds out uh, adequately either. So Ray, I think um, there's always a temptation when you've got a big new shiny header with 600 horsepower under your foot that you can uh, that you can use all of that horsepower and, and pat yourself on the back for doing 50 tonnes an hour, but we seem to think that if we're doing that, that uh, we might be throwing a bit of grain out the back. It's interesting, on my trip with Ari over New South Wales a couple of weeks ago, I ran into John Brother and, and Tim Condon, and they've done some research, and also there's an article in the Condinen group that are all saying the same thing, that uh, maybe we'd just better slow down a bit. It's all fine and well to say you've got to rip this stuff off before the storm comes, but uh, the storm's probably going to do less damage than the amount you've thrown out the back. So it's just... It's the fact that these machines have doubled in horsepower in 15 years. Uh, I think it's a, I think there's a little bit of a trap there. And it, yeah, I uh, think so too. A local yep. grain grower up this way um, was very surprised in how much volunteer wheat he had growing, and he set out to um, do all sorts of things to the back of his harvester to, to minimise his losses, and really he just found that he had to slow down a little bit. And when he slowed down, he 
uh, he stopped spitting grain out the back and it was well and truly worth slowing down for the amount of grain that he was losing. So we might feature that a bit in more detail later on. I'm going to pay him a visit soon and, and show you just how he measures those grain losses because it's really quite extraordinary the lengths that he's gone to to, uh, to measure those losses. I'll tell you a good trick, thing. Peter. Go Drive alongside the header in your ute and you hear the grain hitting on the mud yards. Yeah, there's, there's think, a good trick. If a head of going down yeah. the paddock, drive alongside, and if you can hear grain hitting on the mud yards, it's throwing it out of the back. Yeah, <laughs> there's a good little yeah. trick. <laughs> yeah, excellent. And the last one there, we talked about swathing and setting harvest on day zero to to minimise that weed seed loss, and and there are tricks that we can do to to keep those swaths up off the ground so that they can be left for a period of time without risking uh, losing any income. Okay, so that sort of wraps it up today. Thank you very much everyone for your attendance and thanks especially to Ray. Um, great to have your expertise, Ray. We, uh, we're researchers and we're communications people and so on. We're certainly not um, experts in, in farm machinery, so uh, very grateful for you coming on and sharing your knowledge and, and uh, hopefully this will lead to a, a bit more discussion on the topic down the track. So thanks very much, Ray, uh, for joining us today. Yeah, my pleasure. And no, I'm not an expert either. We're still all learning together. <laughs> we are indeed. And uh, I think this area that we've talked about today, we've still got a lot to learn. And, and I think, uh, yeah, I think we'll, like you say, we'll learn from each other. There'll be a bit of research, but there'll be a lot of grower experience as well. Yep. So once again, thanks everybody. Um, there's a lot of stuff on, on the Weed Smart website about harvest weed seed control. Good place to go. And, and check it all out and a recording of this webinar will go up very shortly uh, if you if you miss some points and you want to go back and have a have a bit of a listen about a couple of bits of detail uh, then 